everyone. This is Adele Newton. I am the chair of the communications committee for ACM SIGGRAP. And I'm happy to welcome everyone to today's webinar, which is the first in a series of online presentations that are being offered by SIGGRAPH and this one specifically by the SIGGRAPH History Committee. So we're looking forward to um, engaging you all in this particular really important topic on preserving your legacy. We've got Mary Witten, who is on the executive committee and chair of the history committee. Mary attended her first SIGGRAPH conference in 1977 and was a founder of Iconis Graphic Systems and Transept Systems. And she's done lots of different things in SIGGRAPH including being the uh, chair and, uh, and working on any number of committees. She's now a mostly retired research professor and sm spends most of her time uh, working on preserving computer graphics history. We also have Ed Kramer, who is the chair of SIGGRAPH Pioneers. I'm sure everybody knows Ed and Mary. Dave Kasich, retired as Boeing Senior Technical Fellow in Visualization, participates in numerous professional organizations, including ACM and ACM SIGGRAPH. And then Joan Collins, of course, has served on the LA Chapters Executive Board since 1981, chairing the group for eight years. She is now Chair Emeritus. And Amanda Wick, I'm going to let you introduce yourself. I'm going to toss it over to Mary Witten, who's going to talk about the SIGGRAPH History Committee. The mission of the History Committee is to collect, preserve, make materials accessible, and to document the impact of ACM SIGGRAPH. Unfortunately, we are seeing people die off uh, who made the history and their stories, and sometimes their stuff goes with them. Uh, tapes crumble, boxes and files uh, get thrown out. So bugs get, get into the boxes and things get thrown out and we need to make sure that, that we preserve things before this happens. So we work with people who are building collections. Joan will talk about collections that she has helped build. Um, I worked on a project to collect uh, physical and then scan copies of all the course notes going back to the beginning. We work on building infrastructure. There is a strong effort in doing a graph-based uh, taxonomy and indexing system. When you think about the kinds of things that SIGGRAPH has its fingers in, we need to have tools to help find it. And we have some people who are very interested in working on that. I think the purpose of today's thing is to talk about how we can support people who are interested in preserving their uh, personal collections. I'm gonna give you a few examples of the kinds of things that I have since I have been an entrepreneur twice, I have been a society volunteer, I have been a researcher at a university, I have a diversity of stuff um, amongst, well, it's in the attic, it's in the garage, it's in the living room, uh, whatever. When you're an entrepreneur, I was a hardware designer, I cleaned the bathrooms, I uh, laid out PC boards, and I did marketing. We still have, uh, my husband Nick England and I, have still have hardware. That system that you see on the right-hand side went to SIGGRAPH in 98 for the 25th year, and it ran. Uh, it's still in the garage. It's still in the box it came home in. The board on the left, oh, it's my master's project. It's a matrix multiplier, programmable matrix multiplier. So an entrepreneurial pack rack. You might have hardware, the design documents, the acetates. Uh, you see the, the rainbow iconus up at the, that was the sign at the top of the booth. It also showed up in 98. Well, now it's in the garage, back behind all that stuff. That uh, Sun chassis with the supercharger on it, it has what you can't see there is the go-kart wheels. Um, all the parts are still in the basement. What do I do with something like that? As a SIGGRAPH volunteer, I was on the executive committee for almost 10 years. I've got files for almost every executive committee meeting I went to, and particularly from the years when I was chair and then after that. One of the things we did was a strategic planning workshop at Snowbird. People might be interested in the final report, probably not so much interested in the documents that led up to planning that event, or in this poster. I think anybody who's a SIGGRAPH volunteer gets swag. T-shirts, mugs, pins. I think the things that are probably hardest and that many of you who are, are on the call today will find is that you've got notes from your research work. And under trying to figure out what of that is important, I think is very, very hard. I struggle with that. I've been working with Fred Brooks on his archives, and that is one of the hardest things for us. So, you know, what's important enough to keep? Did, did it win an award? Was it in a product that was influential? Um, 
I hope Amanda will tell us and give us some guidance on that. First thing I had to do was clean out my office, which they made me do last summer. That brought 30 banker's boxes to our house. Then I've got to clean out the attic, and then we've got to clean out the storage garage. And I suspect that many of you are in the same situation. So, a person who has made a wonderful effort and has been a major contributor to the activities of the um, History Committee is Joan Collins. Thank you very much, Mary. Um, I just wanted to thank everybody again for um, coming to this webinar. We're going to try to answer as many questions that we have heard of over the last several years. And even uh, up until this uh, webinar, we've been getting questions also. Um, I landed in Los Angeles in 1980 and was immediately onto the Los Angeles Chapters Executive Council uh, by 81 and was their operations manager. And we just took off about three speakers per month at least 10 meetings a year of that caliber since 1978. We've run continuously. What do I do with all of those presentations? Uh, in the 80s and backwards uh, is the most important stuff that I should try to go find uh, because from 1990 on it's uh, duplicatable, which is unlike Mary Witten's, uh, she's actually going after, you know, archiving the conference as well. Um, so um, since I also worked at Robert Abel, uh, and also did the 1987 film and video show. I have already sent some archives up to the Babbage. Uh, Mary Witten was the one that was uh, the person who got me um, uh, up to the Babbage uh, for an archiving workshop. And it was um, Arvid uh, Nelson right before Amanda, who uh, schooled me on also how to um, tell everybody about the deed gift and everything else. Since then, after that archiving workshop, and I hope uh, this is essentially a fast pace, try to answer all your questions in you know, as brief as possible, and you can call us afterward. Real important in the 80s was Dean Eaker's Computer Pictures Magazine, which evangelized all of computer graphics. Amanda took all of his original magazines, scanned them, Dean Eaker retained the copyright, and we went on. Every single person I've talked to has been a completely different type of archive. So um, let it be known that you really need to contact us because you don't know what's important or not. A lot of you are in that same uh, position. If you feel like you have no idea if it's supposed to be archived or not, really, really, really know that what you have done is important. Don't be dumping what you have. We are trying to get together a SWAT team to help us out with this. So we will uh, increase our archiving staff. But I'd like to now segue to Dave Kasich, who is going to tell us about um, CAD CAM and stuff. Uh, I've been involved with computer graphics since 1969. I made computer animated films on microfilm recorders as an undergraduate. Retired from Boeing, so I represent an aerospace, highly different usage scenario than most of the entertainment world does in terms of dealing with complex computer graphics issues. Uh, I wound up be becoming an ACM fellow. I have the unique uh, perspective because I've been to every North American SIGGRAPH conference. One of the things that I discovered in walking through my own stuff is it's all a matter of what your perspective is. I have all of the technical papers published from SIGGRAPH 1974, which is an issue of a journal called Computers and Graphics. I have a list of the registrants in the attendee list from SIGGRAPH 1975, interesting group of people. I have shaded images that I collected during some research I was doing uh, in 1974 that includes pictures of trees, branches, and even camouflage tanks that was done by Magi in 1974. I have a fascinating proposal that was done by a guy named Ivan Sutherland was one of the principals and co-authors of that particular report. Finally, I have the results of a joint study that Boeing did that had significant commercial implications. The joint study was done with IBM on a device called the IBM 5080. And there, this leads to a different perspective of what turns out to be important as you look through your stuff. There are less interesting things I'd argue that uh, for, for me, that Mary has tons of, including t-shirts and cups and mugs and things of that nature. One of the things that you have to do is look, especially if you were involved in a large company like I was, 
You have to pay attention to proprietary markings and may in fact have to seek permission to archive things. I'm encouraging everybody on this, this, their, this call to do their sifting sooner rather than later. Not only because as Mary pointed out correctly that it deteriorates physically, but some of us deteriorate mentally as well. And so I'd like to encourage you to pay attention while you can still pay attention. You can also donate when you want. I have multiple items that have been archived at a, a local mu museum here that's devoted to the Holocaust uh, in Seattle. Uh, Boeing has a collection of my archives. I'm happy to donate those things with the notion that I have been able to stipulate that I want access to those items as I have donated them so I can see the physical artifacts should I need. Anyway, that's the end of my piece. And I will turn it over to Ed. You know, since uh, we're all big on historical perspective, I, I do want to um, shout out uh, to everybody uh, dealing with weather issues in Texas now. Uh, we all wish you guys well. And I want to point out that today is also the day we freaking land on Mars. So, you know, that that's just awesome. I can't wait until later this afternoon and uh, and those first pictures start coming back in case anybody didn't know that. <laughs> that's also happening today. I, I, and I also want to point out uh, the shirt from New Orleans from 2000 because a couple of days ago was Mardi Gras or would have been Mardi Gras had we not been in this uh, pandemic. Just a, a, a couple of words about me. I, I worked at Industrial Light and Magic for 12 years and uh, supervised the scarab sequences from The Mummy and uh, the rock monster from Galaxy Quest and uh, uh, scenes in the end battle and droid factory sequences from Star Wars episode uh, two. So, so my background has always been in entertainment, but I'm speaking now as the chair of the Pioneers Group. And the Pioneers Group is about, uh, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of 700 folks who have all been doing CGI work and, and not necessarily at all for the movies. We do have kind of a, a, a much broader group of people in CGI uh, in all aspects, aerospace, education, uh, research. You know, we have the people who wrote some of the original algorithms that let us, you know, do ray tracing and hidden surface removal. We have, uh, um, you know, people who designed chipsets. So uh, people in medical and all kinds of research and, and uh, scientific visualization. And, you know, there's all kinds of uses of computer graphics. But I was thinking about this issue of how do we document projects that did have to do with movies? Because there's studios that own that stuff. You know, I, I have here, this, this was Eric Armstrong, who was one of the animators on the original Jurassic Park. And this is his notebook. He left it in the office when he left ILM. He had drawn by hand what goes on in the, the mouth of the raptor, um, because apparently that had not been done before. So, so what do I do? with things that are of film importance as well as CGI importance. And so I have reached out to the American Film Institute, um, to their uh, lead archivist, and she's out of the office right now, but I'm gonna be hearing back from her next week. And perhaps there's some way to bring the AFI's film archiving program into this discussion as well as the Charles Babbage and the um, Computer History Museums. Joan did mention that we got the papers and effects from a man, uh, she, Joan didn't mention his name, his name is Lee Harrison III. I've become friends with uh, Lee Harrison's widow. Lee was the one who had this idea back in the early 1960s um, that somehow he could use electronic computing to help out in the animation process. And he started a company called Computer Image Corporation. Um, and he brought together a bunch of researchers and they developed these machines called Scanimate, Animac. Uh, eventually the, the, the last one they developed was called System 4. And I was very fortunate to be hired at ImageWest back in 
1981 to be a Scanimate animator. We used this computer that was programmed by plugging in wires and turning knobs and flipping switches. Lee passed away in 98. His widow, Mary Lou, told me that she had all of Lee's notes from Computer Image Corporation in crawl space in between her main floor and her basement. So Joan flew out to, uh, to Denver and the three of us, Joan and myself and Mary Lou, went into the crawl space, got all these boxes out, and, uh, and it turns out there was a treasure trove of all of the, um, the documents that were involved in the analog animation period before things became digital. We were all able to send those to Amanda. Um, and so she may talk about Lee Harrison's collection or, or at least mention it. As Pioneer's Chair, one of the things that uh, I've already done is created a, um, basically a, an email called legacy at siggraph.org uh, to kind of have people who are pioneers start sending us just information about what they may have out there. And it, it's yet to be determined what we're going to do with all this or how we're going to coordinate it with Amanda and with all the archiving projects out there. Um, but the, the, the SIGGRAPH pioneers um, are going to be a big part of it because kind of <laughs> every SIGGRAPH pioneer probably has exactly the kind of stuff in their basement that we've, uh, we've seen from Mary and Dave. I guess it looks like I'm gonna introduce Amanda. Amanda Wick, everybody. I am Amanda Wick. I am the archivist for the Charles Babbage Institute Archives. Um, we're located at the University of Minnesota and we're part of the Archives and Special Collections Department. First thing I'm gonna do is talk a little bit about what who CBI is, what we do, what we collect, and then I'm gonna uh, talk a little bit about the collections that we have with some SIGGRAPH folks, as well as uh, just a kind of an overview because I feel like I get a lot of questions about, you know, it is my, it, are my things archival? Should I collect them? Should they go to you? Should they go somewhere else? And so hopefully I can at least, as, those are big, big questions. Um, and so hopefully I can start to get through that. But CBI, as I noted, is um, part of the University of Minnesota. Uh, we are a very unique institution at the U. Uh, we are split between an active historical research wing um, that's affiliated with the College of Science and Engineering's History of Science, Technology, and Medicine program. Um, and then there's the archives, which are owned by the university libraries. So that, that's kind of where I land. Um, we collect material related to the, both the technical and the cultural history of computing. Um, our researchers are global. Uh, they're historians, they're artists, they're media studies folks. Occasionally we get... Um, the genealogist who's interested in finding out more about what their grandfather did at Control Data Corporation, but that doesn't come so often. Most of our researchers are, are very academic in nature. Some fast facts about our collections here. We have over 300 distinct collections of records. Those include personal papers, corporate records, organizational records of associations, uh, subject files, still and moving images, digital records and artifacts, we have over 10,000 books in serial issues. Um, altogether, we have about 5,000 linear feet of physical collection materials. And then just some fun facts. Our oldest thing is a book by Charles Babbage, uh, 1830. And then we also have material from as recent as this last year. A couple of my favorites, one of which is actually from the Computer Image Corporation. It's test footage of Scooby-Doo and Shaggy walking. And it was just on this like tiny little reel of film. And when I opened it, and I was, I, I could not believe when Ed told me this was stuck in a crawl space, and it was still in such good shapes. We also have a lot of stuff called gray literature, zines, broadsides, and pulp fiction. Um, this is kind of important because I feel like a lot of material from con conference proceedings is also included within this, as well as some of the unpublished articles you might have. Um, altogether, we have, again, this fits into that kind of 10,000 volumes of print material, and that's all cataloged in the University of Minnesota's library catalog. Uh, so it's very easy to access for people. It can be accessed only on site in Anderson Library, which is where, where I'm located. We also have a huge amount of oral histories, probably over 400. Uh, transcripts are available for many of them through our website. Uh, we do not make a lot of the audio or video recordings available. 
part of the reason is that most of these oral histories are conducted by uh, the CBI historians uh, for their research projects. Um, and a lot of times they do give permission uh, to the interviewees to be edited. Uh, so a lot of times the recordings don't line up completely with the transcript. And in those cases, you know, they don't want to release the, the audio or the video. And that's totally uh, your prerogative um, and the decision of the interviewee. It's surprising to a lot of people, I think, that we don't have a lot of born digital collections yet. Um, the ones that we do have include those of Scott Graybaugh, who was a former Cray research em um, employee. And uh, he, he gave us pretty much all of their marketing material, as well as every single manual for a Cray machine. So that's, it was, it was super exciting. Uh, Gordon Cook also donated both his personal papers as well as the Cook Report on Internet Protocol. Um, Prodigy Inc., which was an early internet provider, gave us all of their corporate records as well. Um, in addition, we have digitized collections from Control Data Corporation, the Burroughs Corporation, and also the Association of Computing Machinery. So we are, it should be noted that we are the institution on record for archiving the ACM's mis uh, history, historical records, um, as well as I, both myself and our lead historian, Jeff Yost, are on the history committee. Uh, with Mary, so it's kind of, it's a good connection there for us. We have a huge amount of stuff on uh, Minnesota's computing history, so this is just a few list of collections. Um, and then here's some of the SIGGRAPH related collections. This is not an exhaustive list by any stretch of the imagination, but it can give you some idea of the range of collections that we have here. Personal papers, corporate records, organizational publications, um, as well as just organizational records. Um, and this image is also from the computer pictures. So as, as Joan mentioned, um, when Dean gave us the complete run of the magazine, we digitized it and um, have published it again online. So we have a huge focus on um, social issues in computing. So not just the machines. And in some of our collections, we find things that are related to social justice, uh, labor organizations, um, labor movements. So kind of documenting some of these uh, more hidden stories or hidden voices from the history of computing. Probably the main reason that you guys are still listening to me is you're wondering how do we get stuff into the archives? What makes, what makes something um, archival? So what we have here, and this will be uh, distributed as a, as a handout later, is kind of a look at what, um, what factors determine the boundaries of a collection. So the key criteria, uniqueness, um, is it personal or professional, um, and does it document cultural or heritage items? So if it falls anywhere in here, you're probably good. Uh, determining research value. This is the most critical point for me as an archivist at an academic research institution. Now, a museum archivist might have a different perspective on this. Um, in fact, I know they do. But what's important for me if it in deciding to take in material is will it be useful for historical research? Because that is the audience. At an academic research institution, we take in materials with the idea that they are going to be openly accessible to anyone um, and to be used either by researchers or through, um, through instruction, teaching and learning. The one thing I will almost never accept though is realia and textiles. Storage is a nightmare and preservation of those is, is not easy for them. We're just not the best suited. And again, that goes into the research value. Um, a plaque is just not something that you can get, a, a researcher can really get that much information from. Uh, yet they can, if they have a record of an award being given. So, you know, for everything, there's gonna be an it's de it depends, except when it comes to those two items for the most part. Um, but again, this is gonna be a handout. So if you can't see it, uh, all the details. I know it's tiny print. Um, you will have a copy afterwards to share. And now I'm going to hand this back to, I believe, Joan, who's going to introduce introduce Mark. Thank you so much, Amanda. Mark Sylvester, he's one of our golden children of the archiving process, <laughs> where we landed on him and he just like said, here's my garage, and we archived it. Mark is with, uh, or was with, Wavefront Technologies. Joan, thank you so much. I, I was looking at the uh, participants list and it's like a who's who of computer graphics. Um, yeah. And I feel humbled to be in this group of people. 
Uh, Joan, I want to thank you specifically for the email that went out to a hundred of us uh, six years ago, uh, inviting us to participate in the project. And I also want to thank Art Dorinsky, who is on the call. Um, he was the reason I got into computer graphics and the reason Wavefront even exists is a result of a workshop I went to uh, back in 1983. So thank you, all of all of you folks. Uh, what I want to do is I want to just share my experience a bit of of what what this was like, this process for me. Um, I had um, I was the pack rat at Wavefront, and I mean I had serial number seven of the SGI machine. I had my save literally saved everything, and had stored that for uh, I don't know a dozen years uh, here in Santa Barbara. And when I got the email, I was like, great, I finally have, I, I know what I can do with this. I had been investigating various places to put this, but this was like the perfect place. Because when it was explained to me how this material was going to be used as uh, as the fodder for researchers in, in years to come, and then why it should go to the, the Babbage Institute was, and not the Smithsonian or other places like that, and the reason that was given to me was that this information is available right now. They don't have to wait for years. Researchers don't have to wait for years to have access to it. So what started out as a, a kind of a simple email turned into a bit of a journey. Uh, very fortunate to have Arvid Nelson, who was the archivist at the time, uh, actually flew out to see the collection because I had a, a whole storage locker. And I, I remember distinctly, uh, Joan and Art drove him up and we opened up the door and it was just packed to the gills because I had every video that had been submitted to Wavefront for submission in our SIGGRAPH sizzle reel. I never sent any of them back. I kept them all. So I had all of this stuff, plus all the data tapes, et cetera. And our Arvid says, well, what's here? And I said, well, let's just pick a box. And we spent an hour just going through one box of stuff and, and each individual piece had a story to it and i said is is this what you're looking for and he, and he just looked at me and says we'll take all of it and i i was kind of amazed and i and i, I want to show you a little bit of what what all of it means and so things like um maya which is um you know it, it was a has made a pretty big dent on the world um, having the box and all the original data tapes and all the um, the the meeting notes, uh, the the thing that was interesting when I heard about like what the scope of of the project is, is taking this slice in time. We were just one part of it here in Santa Barbara, but then being able to understand the cultural implications, what was going on at the time. I, I appreciated what Amanda was saying when she showed us that Venn diagram of, of what's interesting. So, you know, there, there was that. There was, um, you know, the thing we made internally, which was the, you know, the gold master uh, for Maya when we, we went onto the Mac, you know, things like that that were stayed in the company uh, are of interest. Um, this, one of my favorite t-shirts of all time, uh, done by the crew at South Park for our big user group meeting. Uh, we had 5,000 people at the LA Sports Arena for a SIGGRAPH back in the day and gave everybody one of those. That kind of memorabilia and the stories attached to it, I didn't think were important, but uh, apparently they are. Uh, and then things like photographs, uh, the SciTech uh, awards, and those kinds of things where the work that we uh, collectively had done uh, was recognized. Um, and then this one, I, I because this this particular notebook was in uh, that first box, and I said, "Do you want?" He goes, "We want everything." And especially, it was interesting what Arvid said was, "We would love to see marginalia." So the notes that you wrote on stuff, because that's going to help researchers in the future understand how you made decisions, how things evolved, how how stuff um, came to be, um, and then. Uh, you know, just like all the ads, how did how did we present this at the time? How did we talk about what we were doing? Because, you know, I think at the time we took this as a matter of fact of what we were doing, but it, looking in hindsight, it was also incredibly unique. So I would 
uh, encourage everybody to consider getting those boxes out. I want to tell you just a little bit about the logistics once uh, you've made the contact and, and you've decided you're going to send things. Um, every single one of the 2000 pieces was labeled, photographed, and, and given a record, which was then sent to me, which then I sent to an appraiser. And we, pre we created a document that then went uh, to the IRS so that there was a, a valuation put on that. It's kind of hard to value this, but um, that can be done. So there, there is a, a little bit of, um, you know, a little love that you get from the IRS on that. But what was fascinating, my last story was the um, intern or the student who was in charge of photographing all the pieces over uh, Christmas break in 2015 would post these pictures on her Twitter feed. And I was following her because she was so interesting, but she held, she had this, um, uh, I, all of the um, uh, uh, badges that you get from trade shows that we went to, and you all have those, right? You just have these piles. And she has this picture he's holding, and, and it said, I don't know what this is, but I think it's important. And I, it just cracked me up because see, this was someone who had never been to a trade show and uh, being able to write her a story about that was probably a million dollars worth of trade show badges there. So thank you so much for, um, for you know, letting me uh, share all of this and uh, get a chance to be a part of this important conversation. Um, Mary Witten, if you could just speak to um, questions about, you know, all the course notes and everything else, and if we're sending them to you, or if you have them all, or how do we know if you have them all? So we have probably all, but well, Amanda's list says she has 265 volumes or something like that. Um, we're probably missing 25 or 50. Um, I don't currently have a nice list of which ones are missing. Um, the intent is to make such a list. I would love to have a volunteer help me with that stuff. Fantastic. Also, um, uh, Amanda, there's a lot of people that um, are wondering if their stuff, like if I have uh, Wayfront or if I have Robert Abel or if I have some stuff like Ed showed, uh, what are your recommendations on that kind of stuff? When it comes to stuff that's from companies that you work for, so please use your own discretion yeah. on that. I have a material in our collection that's from people who were very big at IBM, who have donated IBM records to me. I have right. people, I have records from people who were very senior at Lockheed Martin who have donated records to us. Um, you know, we'll, we will take them in and, and operate under the assumption that this is, this is fine for us to have and make it accessible. Right. I actually got one from uh, by email from Je Jeff Kleiser asking, I have a variety of data stored on nine track exabyte DLT, DL DTF and lots of other formats that I can no longer read as all the hardware is gone. Does the Babbage support hardware capable of reading retired formats? We, we don't necessarily have access to that. Uh, a lot of those machines that are required to read that um, currently on location. Um, that said, there are vendors that we can use and we can pursue. That does cost a fair chunk of change to get that material converted. Um, but it's something that we're exploring right now. Uh, there's a few grant opportunities that I'm looking at with the Council on Library and Information Resources. But especially for SIGRA folks, you know, just the wide variety of storage formats that y'all use um, does make things a little bit complicated for us, but it's certainly something we can talk about on a one-on-one -on -one conversation. There's a question here from Valerie Latera Spletzer. I bought at auction 16 millimeter film of early NASA computer animation used to communicate to the public what the space program was doing in the 60s. Should I convert that to digi digital myself or is that something you prefer to do on your end if you're interested in this footage? Um, that's definitely something we'd be interested in, um, as well as any other records that are personal papers that you would be willing to donate. If you wanted to convert that, you could keep a copy. That would allow you to keep right. a copy of, your of it for yourself. We have just two minutes left. What I'd like to do in that time is to let you know that 
we will forward the uh, material, the backup, the handout material that Amanda talked about from the Babbage Institute to everyone who's registered. I'll just email that to everyone. If you have any other questions, feel free to send them to me, um, Adele underscore Newton at rogers.com. And what we'll do is put together um, a document with questions and answers just to make sure that we get everybody's questions answered in the because we're not going to have time for today. And otherwise, I would like to thank, first of all, all of our presenters today who did a great job in talking about what's important, giving the information that everybody needs to understand why this is important and how to tell whether what you have is something that would be of interest and useful to archive. And also, especially to all of you for joining us today. Um, Ed will do a nice cleanup job on all of this and we will um, upload it to the YouTube channel for LA SIGGRAPH and also have it uploaded onto the SIGGRAPH.org website. And with that, I am going to end today's webinar. Thanks everyone. <laughs>